Hey everybody, Kim Silvio. This week I have an unusual video yet again about the July 15 announcements and data protection. I have taken on board some of the advice provided to me by particularly people who live in Texas who have trouble understanding me. So I'm going to do my very, very best to speak a little bit slower. Um, for those of you who can ordinarily understand me, it's simply just to try and accommodate everybody um, I do apologize because I do speak quite fast and apparently I have an accent who knew so without any further ado let's get into this week's announcements but before I do I do want to thank Atlantis who has provided the information to uh, myself and others so we've got the July 15 announcements for elders I'm talking about the announcement that was made in April 2022 regarding the challenge just in the banking handling matters and transactions, they're announcing that the paragraphs below adjust the current arrangements and that it would come into effect from September 2022. Uh, they talk about how to transfer funds with the branch office, et cetera, et cetera, and the accounting forms and documents that you would ordinarily expect to see in a corporation to be organized and arranged. And then they're also looking at payment requests. And this was the section that I found particularly interesting. It talks about payment requests and it says, starting in, Feb in September 2022, congregations and Kingdom Hall operating committees will be requested to cancel their bank accounts and transfer their funds to the branch. The branch will handle the payment requests in behalf of congregations and Kingdom Hall operating committees. And it says, do not contact the branch to ask when your congregation will close its bank accounts. So this got me thinking and it's really, it's, it's just really confusing to me because of the fact that, you know, I think about back in you know, the late 90s, early 2000s and before, I'm sure, but that's the period of time that I remember where, you know, we used to have the accounts committee coordinator or whatever his role title was and he'd come out and give a report a month and tell us that they spent two dollars 25 on toilet paper and 85 cents on stamps and those sorts of things and you know we only saw that the organization had little money and I'm sure that there were people within the organization that knew back then that the organization had money but I certainly didn't and I probably think that many other people didn't either. I used to look at it and think that that was yet another example of Jehovah's divine spirit on the organization and that we could function and do his will with such a short a small amount of money and so you know I think about those times and I think about uh, you know the changes that have happened from there you know, and I'm sure that again there are many many people who've seen changes well before this time uh, that we that I'm talking about that there have been changes for for decades that it, people could talk about so I think about that and then I think about I've got a friend who's in her 60s here in Australia and she was talking about how when the announcement was made that the Kingdom Hall's ownership would be transferred to the branch office and you know that she felt that it had been stolen from them and that you know there'd been a massive theft occur I think about that and 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 then I think about you know how they changed it the organization changed it so that that individual kingdom halls didn't keep copious amounts of money or excess money for kingdom hall regeneration and all of those sorts of things um, additions etc rather that they were told to keep a minimal amount of money i think in australia it was five thousand dollars but i'm not sure 100 percent. but it was a nominal amount of money and the rest of the money was then transferred to the organization i think that was the mid 2015 2018 somewhere around there it was before i left the organization at any rate and and then I now think about this where they don't even have bank accounts at all, that they're purely at the mercy of the organisation and the branch committees who then decide who gets what funding, what Kingdom Halls get upgraded, what facilities are improved, and whether Kingdom Hall gets kept at all or whether they're sold. And, you know, it's just, it, it's just a really strange situation that I look at and think about, you know, how the organisation's so different. I'm not criticising the fact that they're that they have a process and a procedure because all multinational companies and corporations have policies and procedures and forms and processes that need to be completed when it comes to financial transactions. My, not issue, but my question, it sort of makes me think about these transactions and payments and looking after kingdom halls and transacting kingdom hall processes and arrangements and I haven't got the right words, but you know, 
hopefully what I mean, used to be handled by spirit anointed or spirit directed, spirit appointed, whatever the correct term is, brothers um, appointed by Jehovah. And so I think about it and, you know, obviously corporations do risk assessments and about theft minimization and all of those sorts of things. And from what I can see, it would be reasonable to assume that that this is part of a, a risk assessment for theft prevention and other corporate processes. And it makes me wonder, why do we have to have so many procedures and policies? And why is it that the branch has to have so much control when it is Jehovah's Spirit appointed men that have been traditionally looking after these types of transactions for the organisation in order to continue Jehovah's work? It just sits really ordinarily with me because I think there is no trust or is there a trust issue or do they not believe that Jehovah's spirit appointed men can actually do the work that they want them to do uh, without, you know, there being the question of, of misappropriation of funds. It's just a really interesting thing. You know, they go on in the um, announcement. So it just leaves me with questions, I think, about how much do they trust that elders actually are spirit appointed? Um, or is it the fact that they know that they're not spirit appointed and that they're just people because they know that they're not spirit anointed? In fact, they are just imperfect men. There is a saying, I don't know if it's a worldwide saying, but certainly in Australia, you, you, you know, you have to send a thief to catch a thief. And I'm not making any allegations that anybody's stealing anything. What I am suggesting is that, is it the case that because they are dishonest, that they expect everybody's dishonest and therefore they have to pull their reins back in and there becomes an issue of trust because they are not trustworthy. Again, I'm not making any allegations. I'm just making a suggestion. The other document that I wanted to have a look at was the instructions for use of personal data. This is by no means a new form. I went on to avoidjw.org and had a look and I very clearly found that this exact document, albeit slightly tweaked, um, is there um, with similar information. But I just thought it would be interesting to point it out because I found some interesting bits and pieces that may be useful to others because quite often I've heard or people have asked me about wanting to access their personal data records. It isn't straightforward um, or they don't want Watchtower to have their records anymore. They want to be completely free of the organization, which I totally understand. And they've hit snags along the way. So at point two, it says data protection regulations require that a publisher be informed on how their personal data is used. And it goes on to explain that publishers need to fill out a complete and sign a notice of consent for use of personal data. It goes on to explain to the elders why it's important and, and explaining that to the publisher and all of the nonsense. But the important part that I thought was really interesting, and this is one of the other reasons why I wanted to bring it up, was it says the publisher should be informed that the congregation or branch may not be able to evaluate his suitability to fulfill certain roles within the congregation or participate on many congregation activities, such as serving as a, min a regular pioneer, ministerial servant or elder. And then it goes on to say, the publisher should not feel pressured to sign the consent of use of data form, which <laughs> just, I'm sorry, I've just got to laugh. I, I find that amusing. So, you know, we, we're not going to pressure you, but if you don't do it, you're not going to be able to do some activity. We can't assess your eligibility to be a regular pioneer, a minister, or servant, or an elder, which everybody knows that you're almost a social pariah if you're not reaching out for privileges, particularly if you're a man. Yes, you're not pressured to sign it, but if you don't, there's going to be consequences. Well, there may be consequences because we can't assess your eligibility because you won't sign this form. If the publisher informs the elders that he wishes to withdraw his consent, they have to contact the service department. I find that extremely interesting. And then it goes on to explain the use of personal data without a signed notice. And that to me is very, very interesting. I would question in some countries whether or not that is actually legal. The whole purpose of requiring someone to sign a consent to maintain personal data is because 
Without it, you cannot. So they're saying that the congregation may use and keep. I think that would be a very little, a, a very interesting legal argument. So it says a publisher who refuses to sign the document may participate in any local congregation activities that the body of elders deem suitable for him. So what I hear there is if you are somebody who's been in trouble for, I don't know, brazen conduct or just being a general pain in the side of any of the elders and they don't like you, then they may determine that some congregation activities are not suitable for you because you didn't sign the form. Um, conversely, if you are an elder's buddy, relative, friend, whatever, they obviously may be a little bit more lenient. So I think that there's definitely scope for corruption there, shall we say. The, you know, the caveat is unless the activities require the use of personal data beyond what is described in this paragraph. So it's just very open to corruption where they could use just about any, well, we didn't invite you to the congregation barbecue because we didn't have your phone number on file or we were having a congregation get together one evening, but I sent all the emails out and I didn't have yours. So you're not invited. So it just, <laughs> It's silliness. It's it's basically sign it or else, in my opinion. Uh, so then, the, this is this is my favourite thing out of the whole documents that Atlanta sent through. It says the elders may decide the publisher can participate in maintenance and cleaning arrangements or assignments on the life and ministry meeting. So basically, what I'm hearing there is that. If you're an if you're a man, a brother, you basically become a sister <laughs> if you don't sign the notice form. Um, and if you're a sister, well, you just stay a sister. No big deal. Because that's basically what women do. Maintenance and cleaning assignments and life and ministry meeting assignments. So no big deal for women. Big shame for men because you've now been delegated or relegated, shall I say, to the position of a woman. So that was very interesting. I found, um, I guess the point really was, is sign it, but, 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 but do it voluntarily. But if you don't, you're going to be relegated to the position of a woman in the congregation. Just a couple other items that I wanted to cover. The Last Days um, book by Ali Miller has come out this week. I have actually read the book. Um, I think it's extremely well written. And it's absolutely, I think it's so relevant. And I think that there will be people that will read that book and look at it and think that could be me or that is me or that was me. It's an amazing book. It's extremely well written. If you aren't somebody who likes to read, I actually listen to it via audiobook and Ali actually narrates it herself. It's beautifully narrated. It's just, I cannot tell you how much I really, really enjoyed the book. I learned a lot. Some of you may realize that I'm not, I wasn't born into the organization. So for me to have a greater understanding of the issues relating to those who were born in, particularly the way some people, you know, the way children hear content on the platform, they don't understand it, but they take an understanding. So they don't have the correct context. They apply it to themselves and and they internalize it and they personalize it and they scrutinize themselves and fear that it can create and the uncertainty that, that, that it can create in the life of a child was something that that book really, really illustrated to me clearly. And it gave me such insight and it really shows me that the long term mental damage um, that can be created from those types of things. And I have every intentions of purchasing some hard copies. And I'm going to be sending them to some parliamentarians that I know of in Australia because I hope that at least one of them will read the book and they may start to really understand the damage that this cult does to people, the impacts that it has on their lives and just how harmful it is, particularly for young children growing up in, in circumstances where they don't know any better or any different or for, for adults who were raised in it and don't remember a life before the, the cult and what it's really like and people that don't have family who are worldly therefore have a, a don't have a uh, they don't have a role model of or an example of an alternative life that is available to them so it's it's an amazing book I can only encourage you to try and check it out if you can I know that if you request it from 
a library. They will, in most cases, order the book in so that you'll be able to borrow it and read it. And it will also serve to benefit anybody that comes along in the future that might read it. The other thing that I wanted to highlight was that the uh, fifth episode of uh, Call Bethel from the UK Telegraph has come out this week. And at the moment, that is the final episode but I hope in the future in the future there may be some further episodes or a further episode or further something but yeah if you haven't checked it out already it's a great series there are five they're available on YouTube I'll try and put a link into the first one below like the video comment if you can because it shows the UK or it shows the media that we have interest and that we're supporting and believe in exposing behavior and conduct within the organization that's unacceptable. So that is me for this week. Thank you so much for listening if you made it this far. And I probably won't be posting a video for a number of weeks now because I am heading off to the UK on holidays next week. So I just, whatever it is that you're up to, I hope you're enjoying your week. Look after yourselves, do something kind for yourself because self-care is not selfish it is necessary and have a fabulous few weeks and hopefully I'll catch up with you again soon.